Hi everyone, we are the 4th of October 2024. I'm happy today to talk with uh, Stefan, who is uh, currently uh, not in Hong Kong, but he lives in Hong Kong. Are you, uh, where are you, Stefan? Well, I'm in Bulgaria today, actually. So I tend to spend, and it's a bit late in the year, but I tend to spend summers in Bulgaria because the humidity of Hong Kong is a little bit too much for me. Yeah. Whereas the weather in Bulgaria gives you the heat, but it doesn't give the humidity. So, But I'm on my way back in the next few days. Next few days. Okay, great. Well, uh, I'm here talking to you because I've seen on uh, LinkedIn a uh, post from one of my connections who's called, well, I guess I can say his first name, Nicholas. And I was uh, very surprised because I saw he has a Hong Kong passport and he's a, he's a European. And uh, I can see some comments and uh, some of his connections saying, uh, why on earth do you have a Hong Kong passport and so on and so on. So I had the same reaction and I asked him and he told me, Talk to Stephen. He's he's the man. He knows everything about Hong Kong immigration and so on. And I checked your profile, and it looks like you've been here since 1993, and you 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 work in immigration. You know everything about it. So we're gonna talk about immigration today. But the main point for me is to know uh, how we become a Hong Kong citizen and why uh, I would say European, Western, Caucasian, white people want to become uh, Hong Kong citizens. Uh, that's very interesting to me. Can we talk about this? Surely. So let me clear up the first uh, confusion in the whole HKCR passport phenomenon. Um, Hong Kong is not an independent state in of itself. So if you secure a HKCI passport, which is the travel document that's awarded to Chinese permanent residents of Hong Kong, actually what you're doing is you're securing Chinese nationality. Because as you can appreciate, Hong Kong is a special administrative region of the People's Republic of China. And so once you uh, go through the process of ultimately ending up with a HKSAR passport, you have en route become a Chinese citizen in the process. Okay, good. So uh, in my mind, uh, everybody knows it's quite uh, surprising to see some uh, European people in China, like I would say just Chinese people who look European, like I am French, I look Asian, I'm French Asian, but it's very common. You have American uh, people who are Asian, you have uh, British people who are Asian. But now, uh, so we're meeting more Chinese people who are, you, who used to be French, Belgian or whatever, American and so on. Uh, how does it work? How can, uh, how can we apply for Chinese citizenship and a Hong Kong passport? Okay, so um, it's a function ultimately of the 1997 handback arrangements. Prior to 1997, clearly we were part of uh, the United Kingdom and it was the laws in force in relation to immigration before 1997 that uh, delimited in effect the opportunity for um, non-Chinese citizens to become um, Chinese permanent residents of Hong Kong. Um, prior to 1997, essentially, uh, all the permanent, all the permanent, all the Chinese permanent residents of Hong Kong were British dependent territory citizens, and they got a specific British-looking passport, said Hong Kong on it, um, and it was uh, a, a, a assigned to know? British nationality at that point. After 1997, the basic law was implemented, and at the same time, Chinese citizenship law came to be applied to all Chinese permanent residents of Hong Kong. And so it became possible uh, after 1997, as a result of the reorganization of all the immigration arrangements, for non-Chinese citizens to convert to become Chinese citizens and at the same time get a HKSAR passport, which came into force uh, in 1997 at the time of the handback. Now, just one final point, just to clear up. Uh, you would have heard, no doubt, of the BNO passport. Well, the BNO passport was actually a kind of a compromise uh, as part of the desire to sort of settle the nerves of the Chinese population in Hong Kong around the 1997 handback uncertainties. Because they had historically traveled on British travel documents, the British government, as part of the arrangements post-1997, created a particular class of travel document applicable to Chinese citizens who were permanent residents of Hong Kong. And it was called the British National Overseas Passport. 
and that was issued by the UK UK uh, government, and uh, Chinese permanent residents of Hong Kong were excuse me <clears throat> were enabled to travel on British passports via the BNO document after 1997. Mm. And but there the were Chinese about, citizens, not British citizens. No, correct, exactly. So if you were a British citizen in Hong Kong at 1997, you retained your full British nationality. But if you had been traveling on a British passport as a Chinese permanent resident before 1997, and you wanted to continue to travel on a British travel document, rather than going for the newly issued HKSAR passport, you could so do. However, <clears throat> that BNO passport didn't afford any residency privileges in the UK, and it didn't ascribe any uh, notion of citizenship rights to the holder. It was merely a travel document. And um, um, uh, just in the wake of the protests, the British government decided that they were going to renegade on the uh, arrangements that were put into place as regards uh, the ability for BNO passport holders to become residents of the UK as of right. So you would have heard some changes in the last two or three years about BNO passport holders and some of their family members being able to procure the ability to move to the UK and to live in the UK under that travel document. But that was never envisaged at the time that the BNO passport came into play. So yeah. I think that clears up sort of the historical piece. Yeah. So to answer your question, how do you get a HKSL passport number one and why would you get a HKSL passport number two? Dealing with number two first. Actually, the HKSCR passport is an amazing travel document. If you compare the travel document that uh, Chinese citizens uh, that carry HKSCR passports versus Chinese citizens who carry mainland passports, yeah, under the mainland, you only get, I think, 86 countries that you can travel to visa-free, or 81 countries. 81 countries, that's right. However, under the HKSCI passport, which is deemed a much more sort of robust document uh, by most of the international immigration arrangements uh, agencies and negotiated on a bi bilateral arrangement, HKSCI passport holders get access to 180, 176 countries visa-free. So yeah, it's right so up there European in the world passport, passport rankings. So it's Mark. quite uh, similar to European passports, actually. It's like a Western passport. Correct. It's a very powerful passport. Um, so uh, it has intrinsic value in of itself, particularly if you take a look more generally at the sort of second nationality for sale market that exists in the world. Um, <clears throat> there's plenty of jurisdictions that provide the opportunity to basically buy a passport for investing in a particular program that enables access to citizenship in those citizenship by investment jurisdictions and with it uh, a travel document a full passport issued by that jurisdiction do you do that also? Some... do you do you provide this service Take care uh, well of i have re yeah I, I concentrate on hong kong inbound um but clearly i've been doing this for 32 years so i have all the relationships in place yeah, you can recommend some people and, and I can I can send people off into professionals in the various jurisdictions that they might want. But to usually, if you want to buy a citizenship, like let's say I think a few countries in the European Union or whatever, uh, you get a second nationality. But if you want to become a HKSR uh, citizen, you have to give up your former nationality, I guess. Well, that's correct. Which moves on to the first point in um, the relation to the HKSR passport. In order to qualify for it, essentially, the first thing you need to do is to become a permanent resident of Hong Kong. You must procure the right of abode, which means that you need to have ordinarily resided in Hong Kong for a period of not less than seven years. Uh, once you have secured the right of abode, which is the permanent Hong Kong identity card, if your connections to Hong Kong and by extension through to Mother China are such that you feel that you'd like to actually become a fully fledged citizen of Hong Kong, um, then you can go through the process of naturalizing as a Chinese citizen. As part of the naturalization process, you must engage with your original jurisdiction of origin and go through the relinquishment process of giving up your then current nationality in order to complete the processes. There's no exceptions. Them. No exceptions, correct, because there's no dual nationality arrangements under Chinese nationality law, so you have to give it away. However, 
not that we encourage this, but I'll just report that I've seen this. Some jurisdictions do enable the ability to reacquire the uh, oh. nationality that you gave up. However, if you do that, that's going to compromise your ability to retain your Chinese nationality. Yeah. So I can say some people do, some people don't. Um, but a lot of people, when they give up their uh, original nationalities, they're doing for for organically good reasons. You know, some nationalities are. What getting... are these reasons? Well, taxation is one. The uh, Americans, for there's... example, they don't want to pay taxes in America. Well, there's that, yeah. Um, then there's frustration with the government. There's uh, a sense that, you know, Hong Kong, China is, uh, has got a growth story. It's got a future ahead of it. I mean, I personally believe that Hong Kong holds the potential, given that we're the most international part of China over the next 15 to 20 years. I think we can go on to become the monocle of, uh, of China, all told. Um, but that's just, you know, my subjective view. When having... you talk about political uh, like reasons, are you talking that like people are a bit uh, uh, pissed off about their 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 their, their home country, that the, what, about the situation, but what's happening? Uh, uh, is, is, is what what kind of uh, uh, when you when you decide that you're going to become a Chinese national, you clearly have a strong motivation to give up your existing citizenship. Mm -hmm. And the frustration that a lot of people have with the way that their nationality... So what can cause this frustration government. apart from taxation? What else? Well, you know, for example, the response to Ukraine, the way that the government have dealt with the Ukraine issue. Geopolitical tensions more widely. Uh, in, in recent years, I've noticed that sort of a lot of people are waking up to the fact that the mainstream, mainstream media are misrepresenting what's actually going on at home, so to speak. Uh, and they know just through their own experience on the ground in Hong Kong and being frequent visitors to China, that the overwhelming majority of the bad rep that Hong Kong and China gets in the mainstream media just doesn't apply, in fact. So people are being lied to. And because they're being lied to, they don't have uh, any trust in the institutions that emanate from their jurisdictions that they were brought up in and, you know, become, so they've called their home all their life. And now that they've become permanent residents of Hong Kong, they're kind of fed up with that. So there's a whole array of different sort of reasons that are in play at the moment. Uh, and every individual situation is different. Uh, and they all make uh, the determination to give up their existing nationality because they've got a good reason in their circumstances. Do you see like more and more like uh, that would be a maybe politically uh, sensitive uh, topic? Uh, some people uh, ask for this uh, passport for ideological reasons. Uh, I have some friends, for example, uh, they, they live in Russia. I, I interviewed them recently. They told me about why they're going there. And that recently we talk about the, there's a new visa for Russian people who want to go to Russia for ideological reasons. They want to escape from the Western like uh, kind of decadence. Is it English decadence or whatever? Like a, or yeah. work things and this and that. And uh, now we, well, there's no incentives from the Chinese government or Hong Kong government, I guess so, but people just do it on their own. Is there something similar? People think like the, the West is going crazy and they're happy in Hong Kong. They see that it's international. People speak English. They can make business. They don't pay too many taxes. They're happy here. They go out safely at night. They, they, uh, it's safe. It's, uh, it's business friendly. Is, the, is that the reason? To... All of the above, Mark. All of the above, as mm. I say. Every individual makes the determination predicated on their own circumstances. And, uh, you know, uh, the world is kind of waking up to the fact that there's a lot of lie telling going on and that you know, not everything back home is as rosy as um, the mainstream media would have us all believe. Uh, and so you think about life in Hong Kong, you think about Hong Kong being a growth story. You tap into the idea that the next century belongs to China, the global south, BRICS, all that kind of good stuff. You want to be part of something interesting. And, you know, all the bad rap that Hong Kong got about national security law hasn't materialized to any degree to represent any kind of real life on the ground problem from any, for anybody that's not engaged in seeking to undermine the national security of Hong Kong or China. So, you know, it's, again, more mainstream media uh, sort of disaster painting through the way that they report what's going on, because they're just going through the sort of geopolitical beat up that's, uh, that China's been suffering for, well, for a decade now, all told, certainly since Trump got elected. Um, so, yeah, look, at the end of the day, Hong Kong is a great place. We live here. We, we, you know, we know what it's really all about. You can do business here. 
<clears throat> we have our ups and downs like everybody, but you know, we are the most international part of China. Uh, and I've always said I'd much rather be under the Amer under the Chinese tent than under the American tent for sure, because we have where, a where are you from? Are you American? So well, that's a good question. No, I, no, actually, I, I was born in the UK, and um, I uh, was a British national until eight months ago. Um, I became an Australian citizen uh, fifteen years ago now. And the British government uh, in June last year decided that they were going to impose secondary sanctions on British, on UK persons who were providing legal advice to uh, Russian nationals that were ordinarily resident in Russia or to um, Amer uh, you, Russian companies that are headquartered in or operating out of Russia. That's what you uh, did? So, so they were they were seeking well. So they were seeking to criminalise a significant part of my immigration practice. So uh, I couldn't. As soon as they introduced those secondary sanctions, I could no longer service those particular clients. So I had to stop servicing those clients until I could go through the process of relinquishing my British nationality, which I did uh, seven eight months ago now. So now I can get back to um, you know earning a living lawfully in Hong Kong, providing advice to Russian nationals and Russian companies that doesn't touch and concern the UK at all, uh, and do so without committing any criminal offences. So you asked me earlier about the reasons why people give up their nationalities. Well, in my instance, that's why I gave up my British nationality. Now, truth is, I had a, my Australian nationality that, that I could uh, lean into. And frankly, I've been living in Australia since the end of 2000 and commuted between Hong Kong and Australia all this time, well, through to COVID. Um, so I've always felt sort of in recent years more of a, a better Brit, a better Australian than a Brit, simply because even though I was educated in the UK, I haven't really lived there since I was 17 years of age. So it was relatively easy for me to give up. But that was a classic example of why people give up their existing nationalities. I decided not to uh, pursue Chinese nationality and get a HKCR passport because, frankly, all my family live in Australia and Australia is sort of where well, I'll, I'll ultimately go to retire and die, die, die. So uh, I'm not going to give up my, my Australian citizenship. But I've always said having a having a permanent identity card is de facto citizenship without a travel document. Right. So once you get your, your, your right of abode, that's it. You know, yeah, you're fine in Hong Kong. Big pardon. Yeah, you're fine in Hong Kong. You don't need uh, to have also a Hong Kong passport. But if people want they do so what well how how many people are getting a hong kong passport every year i've, I've never seen uh, that information before like maybe once or twice uh to one or two or 100 or well, i think you know i think you'd be surprised that uh, look i didn't i didn't research to to look at the immigration department's annual report last year to see you know how that worked out and i don't even know if they even report Mm. Uh, naturalizations. What about you and your your business, your customers? You have oh, one yeah, we, per year. We, we, we probably do fifteen to twenty a year, all told. Fifteen to twenty people per year. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. most of them are from uh, Europe, America, from where? Well, all over. A lot of a lot of Indians, uh, a lot of Pakistanis um, seek to do it because a travel document is a lot better, and their opportunities in Hong Kong are a lot better than they would perceive. Right. In this case, it makes sense. Home. Yeah. But then again, you see French nationals, uh, South African, certainly American. Have you had any French national becoming Chinese? That's very interesting. Yeah. 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 Down the years, definitely. But that, that um, must be confidential, right? Well, indeed. Know. Right. Yeah, surely. Yeah. OK. So let's say, OK, someone I know someone who is French, for example, he wants to become Chinese, Hong Kong Chinese. What does he do? He's a permanent resident. What does he do? Does that have to do just to fill in a form and that's it? Or there's some, well, there must be some requirements and how long does it take and so on and so on. Okay, look, it's a very simple process, all told, but it takes time. So the first thing you do is you apply to naturalize as a Chinese citizen. So you fill in a form and then you adduce certain documents that speak to you being connected to China so that the necessary naturalization requirements can be made out. Now, fundamentally, that's just, are you working? Have you been working for, you know, for a requisite period of time? Have you got a business? Do you speak any Chinese? Have you got any ch close Chinese family members? Used to be, 
when the uh, early sort of uh, days were experienced of changing uh, or acquiring Chinese nationality, used to be a little bit more strict. But the immigration department have now taken the view that, look, if you are going through the process of giving up your existing nationality and you've got the necessary objectively assessed connections to Hong Kong, which everybody has, they're not going to stand in the way of you naturalizing as a Chinese citizen. Um, the application process means that there's diligence that goes on at the back end that I'm not privy to, but it does take some time as they do the necessary sort of background. By the way, check if you're not check. a criminal and so on. Exactly. Interpol checks and other... I'm other, not a spy? Uh, all of those things are obviously... And look, I'm not privy to what happens <laughs> yeah. there, right? But all of that stuff is is no doubt an integral part of the overall background assessment to see if you're you're eligible to naturalise. So once you've gone through that process, which is probably in of itself six, seven months process, then they invite you to come along with evidence that you're in the process of and ultimately do complete the renunciation of your existing nationality. So they don't they don't they don't leave you hanging. Right. They say, OK, we're basically pro forma approving you, but you need to come and show us that you've relinquished. And once we've got a certificate of relinquishment, then we'll finalize and then you become a Chinese citizen essentially at the same on the same date. And then once you get that and the process is sort of eight, nine, ten months, typically, <clears throat> once you get that, then you become a Chinese citizen at that point and getting the HKSR passport is literally just going down to the immigration department, filling okay. in a form, giving the documents. Ten days later, you've got your passport. Okay, so you have to show proof that you have a relinquished your citizenship, your previous right. citizenship. Uh, what is, is a paper from the consulate? Why is that? It's every 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 country has its own process, right? Some countries dictate dictate that you have to go and have an interview. In my case, when I renounced my British nationality, what I needed to do was to uh, start the application online, submit evidence that I did have another nationality that I could lean into, file it online, pay the fee online, get the receipt number. Then I needed to get certified true copies of my what happened to be my Australian passport data and my my uh, cit Australian citizenship data. Um, <clears throat> send those off to an address. I think it was in Liverpool. Uh, then I then I had to wait. I waited about six months or something, uh, and then I got a DHL package in the mail six seven months later, saying that uh, my British nationality had become basically renounced as of a date in February, and that was the end of it. So that was very straightforward. Um, in the US, I believe there's a lot more. It's a lot more challenging because they go through taxation issues. They assess you in such a way because they don't want to lose a worldwide taxpayer. Um, so they do make it more difficult generally than, say, I was able to experience in my UK nationality context. Um, other countries have sort of got different processes. It just really depends all told. And does the Hong Kong government check the, that is the real information? Because if I do a Photoshop, a document and so on, like which is fake, uh, could it work? Well, you can try and commit a criminal offence for any particular <laughs> realm of endeavour, right? But uttering a, good idea. uttering a false instrument to the immigration department is not a good idea because mm -hmm. you're going to jail, go directly to jail, do not pass go, <laughs> do not collect $200. Yeah. Okay, good. So, uh, okay, that's very, very interesting. Uh, there are some people who have both passports because they are born with them. So, uh, so kids of um, uh, like mixed uh, with uh, with mixed parents from Hong Kong and from uh, France or whatever UK and so on uh, they are born with two passports do they keep them well fundamentally yes until they have an encounter with the immigration department at some level or another where they are essentially forced to make a decision as to which one they want to keep now there's a lot of sensitivities associated with dual nationality having acquired it by descent from birth Mm. And the immigration department are sensitive to that. Yeah, I heard it's becoming things are changing, but I'm not. You must know more than me. Well, yeah, you know, and the Chinese government are increasingly starting to take the view that you know, you, if the law says you you can't have dual nationality, you can't have dual nationality. Um, and so if you have an encounter with the immigration department where it becomes apparent that because of your circumstances that you've got dual nationality and you need to rely on a kind of a Chinese institution that flows out directly out of your Chinese citizenship, 
they're then going to basically make you know inquiries as to what you want to do in order to uh, retain both nationalities. Um, and generally, as you get into adulthood and as you need to rely on Chinese institutions, they will they will take the view that they want you to make a decision. Are you going to retain your existing nationality uh, and give up uh, by operation of law your Chinese nationality because the national Chinese nationality act doesn't allow you to have two dual nationalities, or are you going to go through the process of giving up your existing nationality or your second nationality and lean into your Chinese yeah. nationality? But at this moment, we still have like a difference between men and China and Hong Kong. Like, yeah. not, like I know that in China when. Uh, French Chinese kids are born, they have to choose from birth if they want to be Chinese or French. But in Hong Kong, it's different. You can be both. Uh, and to my understanding, in Hong Kong, it's accepted. Is it correct? They don't, like they, don't, they, they don't insist. They don't insist on the law being enforced. Mm. And there's a corollary to that as well, because my kids have got Japanese nas nationality. Um, they've also got British nationality. And they've also got um, Australian nationality. Um, and as long as they are not interfacing with the Japanese authorities in a way that, <clears throat> in a sense, coerces them to make a determination that they should keep or give up their Japanese nationality, it's a question of don't ask, don't tell type of thing. And that generally prevails around a lot of jurisdictions uh, across the world uh, because it, it, you know, it's quite onerous with all the um, obligations that arise from having uh, national different types of nationalities and um, particularly in terms of your ability to you know access institutions in one of those jurisdictions and reside there and all the rest of it so hong kong is no different from that they've gotten more strict in the last well since the protest 2019 prior to that um, the general philosophy was that we don't want to ruffle any feathers that uh, you know we're in relation to dual nationality in that respect because of uh, the um, concessions that were made in this respect uh, through the sensitivities associated with 1997. But as we get further and further away from 1997, as China becomes stronger and stronger, uh, as the generations move on, I think we'll see a lot more enforcement of-, Do of you, um, What's your take now? Let's move to more like, look at the future. Do you still believe that uh, the China is the future because now we have a lot of people saying, okay, it was after COVID, after this, after that, the economy is going down. It's not great in China. It's not great in Hong Kong. What do you think? Well, look, I've been in Hong Kong since 1987. I've been doing immigration since 1993. I actually was doing all the visas for the press packing that run into the handover. So I've seen everything since the Sino-British Joint Declaration, right? Uh, and we've been written off so many times uh, over the last 30 odd years that it just becomes sort of, you know, a bit boring to listen to the same old of this moment generation do the crystal ball gazing about what, you know, the future is going to look like for Hong Kong stroke China. But what I can tell you is that, you know, Hong Kong and China in 1987 was a very, very different place from Hong Kong and China in 1997, which in turn was a very, very different place, you know, 10 years after that and 10 years after that. Uh, and so you only have to look at what's happening across the boundary to see that there's, there's stuff happening there that represents a growth story. And when China grows, Hong Kong grows. So um, the economic doomsayers have been economic economically doomsaying for, in my experience for 30 odd years and none of it's really come true yeah you know do we have our ups do we have our downs certainly we do and hong kong has changed uh, in so many ways every decade or so since i've been here but we'll adjust and you know we will be part of what we're going to be going forward and and we'll be uh, net benefit beneficiaries of that adjustment yeah it's still the place to be 100%. I like to where, say that the future... Where else, where, else, where else is it to go? Do you want to go live in Manchester? Do you want to go live in Munich? Do you want to go live in... You know, I mean, these, these places have their charms, but, you know, you want to go make money, you want to do business, want to eat good food, want to deal with good people, be centre of the world to get anywhere in an interesting sort of growth, growth environment. Yeah, give me Hong Kong any day of the week. Okay. Oh, I have a quick question about the, your service. So people want to become a Hong Kong uh, citizen with a passport. 
uh, you, we've talked about the process, but what do you do? What, do you help them to do, to gather documents? Uh, what are you doing? How right. much does it cost? Yeah. Okay, so so let's not talk about cost. Let's talk about the value that we deliver. Okay, so because I've been doing immigration for thirty odd years, there's not that much that I don't know about how Hong Kong immigration works. So the way our practice is, and there's about forty of us all together. The way our practice is is that people come to us and we have a conversation. We find out what they're trying to achieve. Once we know what their circumstances are as a result of having that conversation, there's no cost to have these conversations, right? Once we know what they're trying to achieve, we can give them the advice that they need to make some informed decisions. Once they've had a chance to consider the advice that we've given them and how to go about sort of, you know, bringing to pass the outcomes that we're suggesting that are available to them, we will either send them to our website, which is I've been publishing in Hong Kong immigration now for 30 odd years. I've got more than 10,000 videos, do it yourself kits, guides. You can do this stuff by yourself. So we send people to the website and say, look, if you want to save money, you know, our resources are there for you. Use our resources, follow the arrows, your home and house. You don't have to spend any money with us. On the other hand, if you actually want to have professional assistance, we'll give you a, a fee. We'll tell you what the fee is. We'll give you a money back guarantee. If you then want to instruct us, we'll be delighted to assist you. So money that's how we guarantee. Works. Okay. 100%. We only take on cases we can get approved. And if we can't get them approved, we send them off to our websites anyway because everything's there for them so they can have a go by themselves. So the website is HK Visa Center, right? So it's hongkongvisageezer.com, hongkongvisacenter.com, hongkongvisahandbook.com, and hongkongvisasherpa.com. Oh, there's a lot of information in that people can look and see... Uh... Just, okay, that's great. Uh, very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to ask you a personal question, if I can. Sure. Oh, well, not really personal, but I want to know, uh, how do you feel? Uh, do you feel more Australian or British? And uh, do you define yourself as a patriot? What do you feel about the... Do, do you like the king, for example? That would be Well, firstly, life. okay. So, that, that, yeah, good question. He's also the king of Australia. No, he's not. Is that well? He is, but he is, but he's not. It doesn't doesn't really work like that. <laughs> we're 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 actually a functional republic, but shh, don't tell him that. <laughs> um, I'm a look. I'm a cultural Brit, so I'm a uh, I'm a, a working class kid from Blackburn, Lancashire, trying to make good. Uh, I'm also you know a legal scholar, I'm qualified as a, a UK solicitor, getting my law degree from the London School of Economics. So uh, I've got a very strong affinity with the historical British democratic and legal tradition. Um, so you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater just because I've given up my legal British status. So I'm a Brit, cult culturally a Brit. Professionally, I'm uh, I, I associate very closely with the. Um, uh, with the Westminster model. So that's that. Um, I moved to Australia when my kids were young and I was able to take advantage of uh, Australia's amazing place to raise a young family. I also then uh, related very closely to the Australian uh, mateship uh, notion that goes to the sort of the cultural roots of the place. It's a very egalitarian society. And frankly, the, <clears throat> where I live in Perth, Western Australia, the sun shines nine months of the year and it does something very you know, positive to your disposition if the sun is shining on your face all the time. So um, <clears throat> my family live in Australia, my home's in Australia. So I'm, I'm, and I'm now legally merely an Australian citizen. I say merely, I'm only an Australian citizen. <clears throat> and I guess I've always been a better, better, in recent years, I've been a much better Aus than, Aussie than I've been a Brit, but that's not to, you know, take anything away from, you know, um, my, my ex-compatriots in the United Kingdom. Um, but I've also been in Hong Kong since I was 25 years of age. I'm 62 now. Uh, my business is here. My colleagues are here. My home, my, you know, this is my life here. I've been a permanent. I was one of the first 100 people after 1997 to get permanent residency under the, the arrangements for right of abode after the enactment of the basic law. Because what I did was I, I took me and my wife's applications for PR uh, down to the immigration department at 8.30 uh, on the first day of the, after the handover holiday for the, um, for the immigration department to process our application. So I know that I was one of the first, and my wife was one of the first 100 
uh, people to secure a permanent residency in Hong Kong under the new then then new law. Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm I'm a Hong Konger through and through. The fact that I carry an Australian passport doesn't in any way undermine the fact that I'm proud to carry my Hong Kong permanent identity card as well. Okay. Hong Kong permanent reason and proud to be it. Indeed. And uh, what uh, a word about the situation in the UK. How's life there? How's the government? How's the, how's the monarchy? Look, I, I think I read somewhere, I heard somewhere that 60% of the GDP in the United Kingdom at this moment in time emanates from London and the area surrounding London. And that 40% of the GDP is uh, dispersed elsewhere throughout the, the whole country. Um, in the major conurbations such as Birmingham, my nephew has just bought an apartment in Manchester and he works in Manchester. Uh, Leeds, I think, is doing okay. The, 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 the major cities outside of London are doing okay. Um, but everywhere else, for example, my hometown, Blackburn, Lancashire, struggling. And, you know, you don't have to surf too far and wide on YouTube to see how, you know, British society is not what it was during the time uh, that I was growing up there. And, you know, I, I, one stat that I always cite is that when I left Blackburn in 1972, excuse me, in 1982, to, to leave and ultimately never return, there were about 100,000 people homeless at that time. Um, now there's more than a quarter of a million homeless. Uh, and then when you think about what China has done in that time to take essentially the entire com the entire population out of poverty and put them into upper working class, lower middle class st uh, living standards. And all that the UK has done is to put, you know, 150 percent more people out on the streets. You know, you compare one against the other politics aside, you objectively assess something's not quite right. So that's what I feel about the UK. Would the you moment. say that the, the the UK is not the UK anymore and uh, the best of the British culture or lifestyle is is better represented in Hong Kong? Well, Hong Kong has got its problems and challenges, right? So let's not downplay, you know, the fact that there's plenty of poverty in Hong Kong that needs to be alleviated and that there's a lot of improvements that need to be um, made to ensure that, you know, all folks in Hong Kong are able to benefit from our prosperity. I mean, a lot of the undercurrents, you know, behind the 2019 protests were tapped into to sort of, you know, create you know, some of that uh, tension. Um, so no, Hong Kong still got its problems, but, you know, uh, I think these problems are being worked on. I just look at the UK that I grew up in until the age of 17, uh, and I look at it now, and I say to myself, notwithstanding the fact that they're two very different generations, um, I, I had a certain security growing up as a working class kid living in a council house. If there was any problems with the council house, got a hole in the roof, the council would come and fix it. We could always turn that. We could always afford to heat the place. We could always afford to, you know, light the place. Um, I could always go out and get myself a, a part time job as a kid. You know, so I'd always have some cash in my pocket and I'd always have, you know, things that I could go and participate in, even with, you know, modicum. Most European of countries can say the same from uh, have this. Well, that might, that might well be the case, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a gray haired 62 year old geezer now, right? So. Um, I'm in the twilight of my um, of my years, if you will. But uh, yeah, the Brit the Britain that I grew up in, uh, in in from 1962 to 1980 uh, doesn't in any way, shape, or form look like the Britain today. And uh, I think if you do a direct comparison as to how China's progressed in that time, mm. problems factored in, and you look at what's happening in the UK happened in the UK in that time. Uh, problems factored in. I think that China's a much better story than the UK story. Oh, last last question. Uh, because it's very interesting. So I have a I want to sure. ask you what do you think about the Hong Kong young people who left Hong Kong like a few years ago because they think they can find some freedom in the UK. They moved there and according to some reports, some like well media and so on, I it looks like it's not that simple. It's not easy to find jobs. It's not easy to make a business. It's not uh, the income is not very high compared to Hong Kong. It looks like they're not very happy, and may, some of them are coming back. Uh, do you know about this? What do you think about it? What's your thought? Okay, so three things. Firstly, most of these young people were gaslit. They were gaslit for political purposes. They wanted. 
they were invited to leave Hong Kong being the future cream of the crop to go and contribute to those other economies at the same time beating China up in the process. So they were gaslit. Uh, and uh, that's point number one. Point number two, as an immigration professional, I can tell you, whenever a, a jurisdiction makes it easy for people to leave where they are and go somewhere new, that's in a very, very attractive proposition. And so they bought into that contention. And I understand that and I respect that. Australia put in new arrangements. Canada did the same. I don't know about New Zealand. UK certainly did the, with the BNO situation. So, yeah, whenever it becomes easier to make a move, people will always make that take advantage of, of making that move. And, and we saw that. Thirdly, here's the other thing, right? Because I was in Hong Kong for the decade prior to the handback in 1997, I saw a huge percentage of our middle and you know, our middle class and our professional class all leave for other places because they were genuinely scared that the tanks were going to come rolling down Nathan Road on the 1st of July, 1997. And so they decamped, they all went. But you know what, by the end of that decade, the overwhelming majority of them had come back. So people have always left Hong Kong. They've always subjected themselves to the grass is greener. They get there and see the grass ain't greener and they come back. So it's just more of the same, really. Déjà vu. Let's say that. Yeah, for sure. Okay, interesting. But thank you very much. Uh, do you have any last words, something you want to talk about before we say goodbye? No, look, if anybody has any questions about Hong Kong immigration, as I mentioned earlier on in this piece, right, just contact us. It doesn't cost you any money. We have a conversation with you. We'll see if we can add any value to what you're uh, what you're all about. And there are our websites. You can always sort of ask a, a question using voicemail, and we always get back to people in 48 hours, And if you don't, even if you don't want to have a conversation with us. So... Uh, we take the view that the Hong Kong Immigration Department's website is great, but its job is to inform. Well, the Immigration Department's job is to inform and decide. It's not their job to advise. So when you go to the Immigration Department's website, <clears throat> it's great. You, they tell you what forms you need, how the process works and all the rest of it. But what yeah, they're not minimum. telling you is what you need to know to be able to use the system effectively with any level of confidence. So there's informed, decide, and advise. Our web presence is, is we fill that missing gap. We uh, do the advisory piece. And it doesn't cost you anything to use the website. It doesn't cost you anything to have a conversation with us. So, you know, please reach out. Happy to help. Always so. Okay, great. And I look forward to uh, having a drink with you when you're back in Hong Kong soon. <laughs> great Thank stuff. You. Thank you, Stefan. Bye-bye. Pleasure.